Hi. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm very excited to be here and to have the opportunity to share some of our work with you. I've never been to Philadelphia before, so this is a, it's a first for me. And it's a really beautiful city on a beautiful day. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, so today, I'm going to talk primarily about robotic skins uh, and how we use them to turn inanimate objects into multifunctional robots. Uh, but we can start with looking at where we are with robots today and have been in the past. I'm sure most of this is a graph seminar, so you guys watch robotics seminars all the time. A lot of them probably start with an image like this, uh, looking at automotive or automotive uh, manufacturing robots. So this is how we use robots today, and this is why we're all doing the work that we do. I assume many of you are participating in robotics research, um, and it's important for this reason. Uh, these robots are extremely good at what they're designed to do. They're very fast and precise and strong, but they're not human interactive. You don't see any people working alongside those robots. They can be dangerous to work around, work around so they're uh, kind of quarantined off from people. And they're certainly not doing anything in unstructured environments. This is a very structured environment. So on the contrary, I think what we all envision for robots in the future is something more like this, something based on humans, on animals, uh, I know that UPenn participated in the DARPA Robotics Challenge, and that you guys had a very successful uh, humanoid robot there. But those of you that participated in that and have seen the blooper reel probably also have seen all of the funny failures from the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Um, robots that just kind of fall over when they're walking around or torque themselves trying to open a door. And the reality is that humans and animals, we don't have these problems. We interact with our environment very seamlessly. Um, I love the videos in here that actually look at animals going between environments, so ones that are jumping out of the water. I think you saw a frog jumping earlier. Here you see a bird catching something out of the water. So this is really interesting and challenging, right? Trying to adjust your body for a different environment, a different medium. Uh, and it's something that we as people and all these animals do without even thinking about it. They don't just spontaneously fall over while they're moving forward. We don't spontaneously fall over while we're walking. Uh, so how do we get to this point? Um, I'm sure many of you are working on problems that are very similar. But one of the things I want to mention is that of all the known species, uh, species known, there's about a million in this chart, but this chart's actually a little bit old, so there might be more now. Um, all of them are at least partially soft. So in the video you just watched, you saw a bunch of animals that are all partially soft. We are almost completely soft. We're 85% soft materials, liquids, floppy stuff. 15% uh, bone, rigid stuff. So we need to have some rigidity, right, to hold ourselves up. Uh, big animals, like elephants and humans and all the things that we're familiar with, we need to have that rigidity and skeletal structure. Um, but there are actually more than half of these animals that are known are completely soft. So no rigid components. Uh, and this is interesting. So, I mean, these animals exist in different media. So most of these completely soft animals exist in water. So they're held up by their environment or in the land, such as worms being held up by their uh, environment around them and the earth. Um, but it, it kind of begs the question, what does material have to do with environmental interaction? Does material and softness play into our ability to interact with our environment? And I would say based on evolution and the fact that all animals are at least partially soft and more than half of known animals are completely soft, I would say maybe it does. So this is why I'm really interested in looking at soft robots. I don't think that all robots in the future are going to be completely soft, but I think that most robots in the future could benefit from the inclusion of soft technology. And so trying to build a completely soft robot starts to help us address some of the challenges that would go into that. So it's a goal. Okay, so I'm gonna do a brief overview of some of the known robots in soft robotics uh, and how they address some of the, the major challenges and advantages that soft robots could have moving forward. Uh, so the first one here, soft robots uh, are very robust to sudden impacts and large forces. I have a couple of videos. Um, some of these are kind of on the older side, but I think illustrate great points. So this first one is the mesh worm. Um, this is a robot that was developed by Songbei Kim when he was a postdoc at Harvard, and I was actually a graduate student at the same time, so we were working together on this. Now he's faculty at MIT, um, but it's a really simple system. So this is just a toy finger trap, and it has a balloon on the inside, and they're shape memory alloy wire actuators. You can see them inducing a peristaltic motion. Uh, and Sangbei is just taking that mallet and hitting the worm, and you can see it just keeps on moving. It doesn't care about the fact that it's been impacted. Uh, without any, there's no interesting control or decision making going on in this robot. It's just purely the material that's enabling this. 
So in a further demonstration, this came out of Rob Wood's group, who was my PhD advisor. Um, so this was uh, the large-scale version of the multi-gate soft robot. Are you guys familiar with multi-gate soft robot? Maybe? No? OK, one person, two people. <laughs> Uh, so there was a smaller scale version that was completely soft, and a group of students in my lab decided to scale it up and try to make it autonomous. Um, so they made this larger scale version and put the electronics on board so it was carrying them around. And earlier in the video, you saw that a car was able to roll over its legs, and it just keeps on walking afterwards. So again, very robust to those impacts, to falling, to uh, vibrations. OK, so soft robots. Sorry, the screen's really high up there, so I'm going to be straining my next one. Soft robots can change in both shape and size to access denied spaces. So you hear a little bit of military speak there. Um, now, this first video is not of a robot. Um, this is of an octopus that's stuck in a bottle. Some of you might have seen this video before. It's an oldie but a goodie. Uh, I don't know how the octopus or when the octopus got in there, but here you can see it emerging. And even though the length scales of this octopus are much, much larger than the bottle orifice, you can see it. Uh, pushing itself through and coming out. And if this is something you think is cool, I recommend just using YouTube to look at octopuses going through pipes. Um, there's a ton of these videos, and it's so amazing what they can do. Um, and uh, actually, there's only one part of the octopus that prohibits uh, how small of or impedes its ability to go through smaller and smaller holes. Do you guys know what that is? The one rigid part of an octopus. The beak. The beak, yeah, that's right. Um, so very cool. Now towards this goal, um, this is a recent paper that was published in Science Robotics last summer out of Stanford in Allison Okamura's group. Um, and they used, again, pneumatics um, and just inflating a tube uh, and allowing it to grow. So this idea that soft robots can grow to access denied spaces. Um, and here you see it performing all sorts of cool motions and uh, going through obstacles. Just really, really interesting work that addresses this idea of changing in size and accessing denied areas. Okay, so soft robots can be made safe for human interaction and handling fragile and diverse objects. Um, grasping is a major application for soft robotics because we don't need to know exactly what the object, what the shape of the object is. We don't need to be delicate about handling objects. As long as we know the general area that an object is in, we can grasp it and the soft materials will just conform around it. It makes the grasping problem and manipulation problem a lot easier. So uh, Soft Robotics Inc. is a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts that is commercializing this idea. So they have developed these pneumatic soft robotic grippers. Here you can see it doing a pick and place operation with eggs, uncooked eggs. Um, so very, very fragile, and there's very little controls going into the system. It has a camera so that it can just identify the basic idea of where the object is, and then it applies the same exact pressure every single time uh, to handle a variety of different objects and delicate objects. Um, so here it'll prove how soft and delicate the object is by breaking this egg. Okay, soft robots have the potential for interfacing with biological tissues and wearables. So this is really related to this last point of made safe for human interaction. Um, I would say one of the pioneers in this space is Connor Walsh at Harvard. Uh, he's been doing a ton of really interesting wearables work, and that's where this image comes from, um, doing both sensors in fabrics and also actuators in fabrics in order to augment load capacity um, and increase distance traveled by a person wearing his uh, devices. So, um, I mean, the, the benefits here are, are pretty straightforward. Basically, with a wearable, we don't want to uh, restrict the natural mechanics of motion. Um, we want to enhance them and go along with them. Uh, so soft materials are very, very compatible for that kind of a system. In this video, um, this is work out of Kit Parker's group, also at Harvard, where they interfaced um, rat tissue. So they took rat heart tissue um, and bonded it to just PDMS, a, an inert silicon rubber, um, and then put it in uh, an electrical conductive medium and applied electrical pulses. And so that rat heart tissue uh, contracts as it would in the body, um, and they're able to make something that kind of looks like a jellyfish swimming. And I really like this example. It's very simple, but again, it shows this really nice interfacing between biological tissues and soft materials and uh, lends us to think that maybe we could implement these types of things in our bodies um, in order to assist with uh, injury or, or different types of diseases in the future. What would be the lifetime of something like that? What would be the lifetime of something? So, 
Um, in order to make this? After you make it, how long? How long would it last for? That, I don't know exactly how long this lasted for. Um, in our experience making similar devices, the biggest issue is delamination between uh, dissimilar materials. And that can be anywhere, I mean, it depends on the chemistry that you use to bond the materials or whether or not the chemistry of the two different materials might actually enhance bonding. But um, for really dissimilar materials, you might get less than 10 cycles. Here, we're, they're clearly getting more than that. Um, again, this isn't my work, so I can't say exactly how long that lasted for. But well-bonded materials um, will, will last a really long time. But I think more here is the issue of biological cells, right? Oh, yeah, that's what your question, okay. Um, that is a good question that I don't know. We haven't worked with any biological materials in my lab, so I don't feel like I can answer that very well. Sorry. Okay, and this last couple of points I'm going to make are related to each other. Uh, soft robots could be extremely cheap to produce and operate, and they could also be very lightweight and low density. So a couple of examples that I think really highlight these points. Um, this jumping robot that was developed by George Whitesides and Rob Wood. Um, it's, maybe some of you saw this, I think it was published in Science. Um, and they, they basically created a gradient from hard to soft. So they showed that by 3D printing this, this body shell, if they made it completely rigid and the robot jumps and lands, that the shell breaks. So not able to withstand those impacts. Um, and if they made a gradient from soft to hard instead, it would be able to withstand the impacts. Um, and this is an entirely 3D printed system with the exception of putting on the electronics afterwards. Um, so a really nice demonstration. And finally, the Octobot, um, developed by Jennifer Lewis and her group, uh, where they completely 3D printed this completely soft, uh, autonomous soft robot. So this is really clever using um, fluidic circuitry uh, in order to make the robot be able to control its motions. Um, and like I said, completely autonomous. So a really, really beautiful demonstration. So with that, I want to talk about uh, how these robots are designed and for what task. So these robots that I've shown are like our uh, manufacturing robots in the very, very first slide, very good at what they've been designed for. So the locomotion robot was a very good <coughs> locomotion robot. Our gripper here grasps very well. Wearables are designed to be wearables, but none of these robots can do the other tasks very well. So the locomotion robot is not designed to be a gripper. Wearable robot is not designed to be locomoting by itself or grasping anything. So the question is, how can we design potentially uh, more flexible robots? Is there a more flexible design approach for soft robots that can perform multiple tasks? Um, and this is a question I started thinking about early in my faculty career. So right around the time that I started at Purdue, about five years ago, there was a NASA call um, looking for exploratory soft robots. And one of the major challenges was just this. They said, okay, we build these robots and we send them off to far off lands and we don't really know what they can expect there. We don't know what the environment's gonna be like. We don't know what the terrain is gonna be like. We can take a guess, but there's always gonna be unknowns. So how do we make exploratory systems that are robust to unknown and unstructured environments, right? This is a problem we deal with here on Earth especially, but is uh, enhanced, I think, when you look to extraterrestrial environments. So this is the idea that I came up with. Um, I wanted to create robotic skins, taking all of the robotic function, um, actuators, sensors, communication, control, computation, and put them all into a flexible soft skin that can wrap around inert deformable bodies in order to impart motion onto those bodies. So in effect, turning any soft system, any soft inert body into a robot. Um, and there's a couple of clear advantages to this approach. So we can turn any deformable inanimate object into a robot. Um, we can also measure and control object state from its surface. So this is really getting at just the sensory part of it, sensory skins. And because these sheets are made planar, because they're two-dimensional and then being wrapped around three-dimensional objects later, we can manufacture them in 2D, which makes them very easy to, uh, to, to build with 3D printing and other additive manufacturing processes. Um, so this is what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this, kind of our work going forward, trying to build these robotic skins and realize this idea. So I'm first gonna focus on just the sensors um, and also how we were able to utilize additive manufacturing in order to create sensory skins that could be implemented within these robotic skins. So the basic idea that we started with was one that I developed during my PhD, using a conductive liquid for resistive soft sensing. So basic concept is we have an elastomer sheet, we build microchannels into that sheet, 
fill the microchannels with a conductive liquid, and then by straining, pressing, curving the sheet, uh, we can map the changes in resistance to the deformation, resistive sensing. Um, the particular conductive liquid that we used in this case was a gallium indium alloy, um, commonly known as Egain, or there's another commercial, commercially available product called Galenstan. Um, and this is a really nice liquid to work with for many, many reasons. It's highly conductive, about the third, third the conductivity of copper. Um, it's also really low viscosity, assuming it doesn't have this gallium oxide skin that forms on it. But the gallium oxide skin is actually what makes this material really interesting. So you can see here in this image is, uh, this is work by Michael Dickey at NC State. Um, and this is all liquid. This is a liquid structure suspended in three dimensions. So he was using a drop-on-demand 3D manufacturing approach in order to lay down droplets and build on top of each other to make this complex structure that's freestanding yet entirely liquid. And it's made possible by oxidation of gallium. It's a gallium-based alloy, and whenever gallium is exposed to the environment, any oxygen-containing environment, it readily creates gallium oxide on the surface, which encases the liquid and is able to suspend these 3D structures. So very, very interesting and compelling for many reasons, but also makes it really, really difficult to manufacture with. The combination of the viscosity, surface tension, and density of the liquid makes it non-printable or processable by most means that we use to fabricate liquids. So a couple of years ago, or actually more than that now, um, I had a very clever postdoc named Will Boley, um, who's now on the job market. And he had an idea to try to break the liquid metal up into liquid metal nanoparticles. So here you can see just a drop of liquid metal, and we have it in a vial with a liquid, a low viscosity liquid like ethanol or water, toluene. We've used a bunch of them. They all work. Um, and then we use a tip sonicator to apply a ton of energy and break the liquid up into small liquid metal nanoparticles. So here you can see that being formed, and then we create these inks of liquid metal nanoparticles suspended in solution. Uh, and this allows us to process the liquid in a way that we can process any other liquid. So we can use inkjet printing or extrusion printing. Uh, and once it's deposited on the surface, the carrier solvent, say water, just evaporates away and leaves the liquid metal nanoparticles on the surface. So we did just this. Here you can see inkjet printing. Um, we're printing onto a nitrile glove. You can see some electrodes and strain gauges that we're printing onto that glove. Um, and then here you can see SEM images of what that looks like after it's deposited. So this is printing just in water. And after deposited, we took it to the SEM. The water evaporates away. We have these nice liquid metal nanoparticles on the surface. Now, this film is not actually conductive. So all of those liquid metal particles are encased in that gallium oxide skin. Um, there's too many electrical losses between all the particles, and gallium oxide itself isn't actually conductive. So when we deposit the liquid metal this way, we get non-conductive films, not very useful. But the interesting thing here is that we can actually just use mechanical pressure, so just tapping on the surface, to break open each of these particles. So we fracture that gallium oxide skin, the liquid metal on the inside comes pouring out, and we can coalesce traces. Um, so we were able to do that by hand, or we could take a small silicon wedge, which is what we did here, and drag it across to create a really small trace of liquid metal patterned within this larger um, uh, printed trace. So, one of the things I want to mention here that made this kind of challenging um, is that inkjet printing is a drop-on-demand process. So we thought, OK, we're just going to inkjet, inkjet print this stuff, and it will create nice uh, traces that we can activate. Um, and then we're done, right? We've fabricated our liquid metal devices, and they will work great. So that's not actually what happened. We ran into some challenges, which I will uh, briefly go over here. Inkjet printing, like I said, is a drop-on-demand process, which means that it's depositing individual droplets one at a time. It's not extruding just a, a stream of liquid. So here you can see you know, one droplet, two droplet, three droplet. That would be a really slow process. Uh, usually something called print mask design is implemented uh, in order to allow a droplet to fully evaporate before another one is deposited directly adjacent to it. Um, so it would drop here, and then another drop over here, and then go back and fill in the cracks to allow evaporation of each droplet as they're being deposited. So we had these droplets of, say, water with suspended liquid metal particles. Now, we also ran into some interesting fluid effects. So it turns out during evaporation of a droplet, there are always some kind of gradients um, that will either thermal gradients or concentration gradients that will induce flow within that droplet. So these are called Marangoni flows, and the flows will either be going to the outside of the droplet or to the inside of the droplet, as done here. And I'm going to force you guys to wake up a little bit and think about fluids for a second. So in this case, 
where you have a droplet sitting on a surface and you have Marangoni flows pointing towards the outside of the droplet, where do you think all the particles end up? This is an actual question. Yes, bottom outside, right? So right, they're all going to go along this edge, get trapped by surface tension here, and get deposited at the edge. And what do you think happens when the Marangoni flows are pointing inward? Center bottom. Yes, you. <laughs> Participating. I should have brought candy. <laughs> OK, so that is exactly right. We did all of our inkjet printing, our drop-on-demand process, and none of our devices worked. <laughs> We kept on trying to activate them. We couldn't figure out what was going on. Finally, we took some images, and we realized that these Marangoni flows were messing up our process. So all of the particles were depositing either on the outside. So this is commonly called the coffee ring effect. Um, if you ever drop a little bit of coffee, you'll notice that after it dries, you'll get this brown ring because all the particles are settling to the outside. Um, and then the inverse effect here, whenever we had a gradient that would produce this kind of Marangoni flow, all the particles would just pile up in the middle. In either case, we weren't getting continuous particle formations, so none of our devices were working. We had this intended geometry of a perfect rectangle, and we were getting anything but. Yes? What the, so it's either a thermal gradient or a concentration gradient, and it depends. It's, it's a very intricate interaction between the exact fluid and particle concentration and the environments and whatever surface you're printing on. You could intentionally get one flow over the other. You could. You could intentionally get one flow over the other. But we didn't want either uh, in our case. We wanted to just avoid it completely. So my very clever postdoc, Will, uh, sought to address this challenge. And he introduced uh, co-solvents. So instead of printing in a single solvent, like water or ethanol, we decided to mix them. So we had a water-ethanol mixture. And then it turns out when you deposit a droplet of a co-solvent, where, <laughs> where one evaporates faster than the other, ethanol evaporates faster than water, uh, the, they'll, they'll separate. So you get a droplet with ethanol on the shell. It wants to evaporate, so it comes out to the surface, and a water-enriched core. So then we took all of our egain particles, our liquid metal particles, and we coated them in a really hydrophobic thiol, so that they wanted to follow the ethanol instead of staying in the water. So when we deposit this co-solvent droplet and they separate, the ethanol comes to the surface, and so do all the particles. They follow the ethanol to the surface, where they get trapped by the surface tension, and then just slowly, they form a monolayer on the surface that just slowly collapses down, and we get a perfect monolayer of deposited particles. So uh, the really interesting thing about this is that the entire process is enabled by this co-solvent and also the hydrophobic thiol. So this process is actually, it can extend to any kind of particle composition. So we implemented this with the liquid metal particles because that's what we were working with at the time. But we've now extended this to other types of particles, uh, such as shape memory alloy particles. Uh, so we can potentially deposit all kinds of different functional devices using this process since it doesn't actually matter what the particle composition is. So here are some of our devices that we built using this monolayer deposition process. You can see the very nice uh, structured film of the liquid metal nanoparticles. And as just kind of a fun aside, they actually work really well as filters and mirrors, although it's not actually what we were trying to create. So the next step moving forward was to say, OK, how do we use this process that we've created? We've done a lot of fluids now, but we want to build robots. Uh, and sensors. So how do we use this process that we've created to actually do that? So I had another postdoc uh, named Mohammed who went ahead and extended this process to a fully printed soft sensor device. Um, so what he was able to do is use the uh, drop-on-demand printing to deposit uh, liquid metal nanoparticles. And then he actually used the tip that he used to extrude um, both elastomer and the particles to tap out the device, the sensor device that he was actually trying to make. So here you can see that tapping out process. We, uh, in this case, tapped out a pressure sensor. So the spiral is a pressure sensor because it's strain invariant. Um, and then we extruded polymer over that. So the polymer would actually infiltrate through the non-centered particles, making it so that we could never center them, and it would lock in the trace that we tapped out. So here you can see the actual pressure sensor in utilization, pushing on it increases the resistance, exactly what we intended. Um, and we also were able to print longer wires this way. The stage that we were printing on is pretty small, maybe about yay big. Uh, and then we did these spiral wires in order to create things that were much, much larger than the stage that we were printing on, which we thought was kind of cool. Um, and then you can also see that we were able to print 
really uh, intricate patterns. So we have a SpongeBob here. Um, fun fact for you, if you actually go and look at this paper, you won't find this image in it because so we published this in advanced materials and Wiley came back and said that we needed copyright permission in order to publish a picture of SpongeBob. So <laughs> I emailed Nickelodeon, um, shocker, they never got back to me. And uh, if you look in our paper, you'll find a picture of a, a world map instead of SpongeBob. Um, so to further this process, this is some more recent work that we've been doing on this project. Uh, this is currently out for review and not yet published. Um, we basically wanted to expedite the speed at which we were printing these devices. So you might have seen that that tapping process was really slow. Um, so it would take us a long time in order to tap things out. Uh, so we started looking at uh, laser centering. So uh, here you can see our, our lab logo. This is the gear. Um, and we were able to laser center that. You can see the centered areas, non-centered areas, and then a larger pattern with very intricate patterns on it. Um, laser centering is a really interesting process because it has both an ablation contribution, it's ablating away the gallium oxide and allowing the particles to coalesce that way, but there's also a thermal contribution. Um, we isolated just the ablation contribution by looking at focused ion beam lithography. So that's what you can see here. Um, using a focused ion beam, we are able to make really, really small uh, conductive patterns. So the smallest part of that is actually only five microns, which to my knowledge is the smallest liquid metal trace ever fabricated. I'm not sure how you would ever uh, connect to it or what it might be useful for. Um, and then also the laser centering process has allowed us to make multi-layer devices. So we can deposit a layer of these particles, use the laser to center a layer, deposit more particles so thick that then when we go to center on top of that layer, it doesn't reach all the way through. So we can stack layers of devices this way and it's highly automated, right? So laser centering allows us to merge the precision and speed uh, and scalability of laser processing with our novel materials uh, for, for soft sensors. So this is something that we're currently working on um, and we're really excited about the directions of this. Hopefully you can see the connections to how we can use uh, automated processing and, and printing in order to make these sensory skins and, uh, and these types of devices. But the next thing we wanted to do moving forward was actually, yes. Yeah, so the particles are actually hydrophobic because you have these dial Yeah, they're hydrophobic when we, when we use the drop on demand process. <laughs> Yes, uh, self-assemble during... Like if you actually have a surface that has kind of hydrophobic areas versus hydrophilic areas, then you just spray coat it and you can actually... Yeah, so we actually tried something similar to this. Maybe you're talking, I think, about more of a chemical process. But the thing that we did try was using surface texture in order to direct assembly of the particles. So we had uh, you know, textured areas and non-textured areas kind of using the lotus leaf effect to try to direct where particles were assembling to. Um, it didn't work as well as we hoped, but using a more chemical process might be a better way of doing it. Yeah. Um, so the next thing we wanted to do, yes, sorry. <laughs> Performance of devices, is that your question? I don't know what the application is. I don't know what the figures of merit would be. I don't know what the relationship between that application method and the performance would be. I wonder how much you would have to do. I'm going to talk about it right now. So can I come back to your question in five minutes? OK. So yes, let's implement these devices and, uh, and see how they actually work as sensors. OK, so one of our first demonstrations using the liquid metal sensors um, which is this sensory module, it's a triangular 2D module with uh, strain sensors on each edge of this triangle. And then by just straining the nodes, uh, positioning the nodes of the triangle, we can use the strain sensors to reconstruct two-dimensional state. Um, so one of the really nice advantages of the liquid metal sensors that we came across is that they are not influenced by the time-dependent properties of the polymer that they're encased in. Uh, so one simple test that we did to demonstrate this was just taking a strain sensor and straining it and then leaving it for a really long period of time. So in a typical polymer, that's a time variant process that will cause stress relaxation in the polymer. Um, and we can see that up here. So we use three different types of common off-the-shelf polymers to show that stress relaxation over time for being strained for so long. 
Um, but then this is the sensory output for the encased sensor, and you can see that it's just constantly giving us a pure reading of strain and not influenced at all by the time-dependent effects of the polymer that it's in. So that's really advantageous since a lot of other soft sensors utilize conductive composites, which I'll actually talk about in just a little bit, um, and those are subject to the polymers that they're encased in. Now, one of the problems that we ran into um, was that we had some significant drift during usage of these sensors. So taking, again, just a simple strain sensor, we cycled it uh, many, many times. So we have, I believe, 500 cycles here um, to 30% strain. And you can see that voltage just increasing with every single cycle. Um, and that causes the voltage to drift and the gauge factor to ultimately drift, which is not desirable for implementation in a robot, um, as you guys, I'm sure, know. Now, the reason for this um, is somewhat intuitive. So again, we have that gallium oxide formation, and it forms every time there's even any exposure to oxygen. So with the strain sensor, we would strain it. It would expose new areas of the gallium to oxide, so we get new layers of gallium oxide forming. Then we return it to its regular state. Strain it again, the same thing happens. So with every single, strain, every single strain cycle, we were introducing more and more oxide into the system, which was ultimately decreasing the conductivity with every single cycle, causing us to see this drift. Uh, so this was not exactly what we were looking for. It would make it really hard to use these types of sensors in actual robots. Another thing that we ran into was difficulty interfacing with external electronics. So it's hard to interface soft to hard. It's even harder to interface uh, liquid to hard. So you can imagine if you have just a little bit of uh, gallium indium, a liquid that you're trying to interface to, let's say you put a copper wire in there, every single time it moves, that copper wire is going to move within the liquid. So that gives us a ton of noise at the interface, again, making it really difficult to use these types of sensors in implementation. So these are problems that we're currently working to address, but in the meantime, we looked for a more stable solution. Before I move on, I want to make sure that I've addressed your question about usage. So I don't have specific figures of merit. Um, the commercially available strain sensors typically don't accommodate the high strains that we're looking to accommodate in soft systems. So we're looking to accommodate at least 50% strain or more. Um, and commercially available options, there's only one that I'm actually aware of from StretchSense, a company based out of Australia. Um, so they sell conductive composite-based sensors that are actually really similar to ones that I'm about to discuss. Um, and they, they have, yeah, like I said, a very similar technology to, to what we're currently developing as well. Uh, but they're the only commercially available really soft sensor that I'm aware of. Okay. So, like I said, we were looking for a more stable solution in order to implement them in the actual robotic skin concept. So, in the meantime, while we're working through some of the kinks with the liquid metal stuff, uh, we decided to develop these capacitive sensors. So, these are based on a conductive composite. We use, um, we use an expanded graphite as our conductive medium. So, we basically take graphite and we soak it in a solvent, then put it in a really hot crucible, which I actually have a video of. Uh, put it in a really, really hot crucible that causes the solvent to uh, evaporate and that expands the graphite to break out into thin flakes of graphite. So it's not graphene, um, but it's very, very small flakes of graphite. And we are able to mix those flakes in with a polymer. So that's what you can see as the black electrodes here. We have this conductive composite as the electrodes, a dielectric medium, a simple capacitor layout. Um, so these actually work really, really well in usage. Uh, we tested them in a variety of conditions. First, we get a standard linear electrical response, which is really advantageous for tracking. Um, we get a typical nonlinear mechanical response. That's from it being made out of a polymer, so we see some hysteresis and nonlinearities there. We did test the sensors to over 100,000 cycles. Um, we initially only tested them to 10,000 cycles, and then the paper went out for review, uh, and reviewers came back and said 10,000 isn't enough, even though it was more than any other cycle testing that we could find in the literature. So we said, okay, we're going to go to 100,000. So that's definitely more than any other I've seen in the literature. Um, you can see a little bit of a, a gauge factor drift, but over so many hundred... Uh, 100,000 cycles over so many cycles, it's, it's quite slow. Um, that drift is significantly slower than what we were seeing in the liquid metal sensors, for example. Um, these sensors are stable to at least 250% strains. 
uh, depending on how we manufacture them. We have three different manufacturing methods um, based on either film deposition or uh, just directly extruding them or mass deposition. Um, but the lowest, uh, the, the least performing one broke down at 250% strains, which was plenty for what we were needing. Um, and we also tested the sensors in a variety of temperatures. So we looked at the range of 22 degrees C to 50 degrees C and found that they were very stable in that range. Um, and that, that was at the request of our NASA program manager who was interested in how these would perform across different temperatures and space. Uh, although obviously we want to expand this range um, in the future. So the next thing we did is say, okay, now that we have a more stable sensor, now that we know that these perform pretty well, we want to start actually seeing if they work on robots. So we started collaborating with a company called Other Lab based out of San Francisco. They have a subgroup called Nubotics that just within the past two weeks um, actually spun out into its own company called Canvas. They still have the subgroup Nubotics within Other Lab though. Um, this company builds these large-scale pneumatic fabric-based robots, um, and they're really fun to play with. I recommend if you are ever out in San Francisco that you see if you can go and play with their sumo wrestling robots. Um, so we, we were contacted by Other Lab maybe um, seven or eight years ago. When I was still a graduate student, actually, they contacted us looking for solutions in order to control these robots better. Soft body control is a really difficult problem. So they said, okay, can we develop some soft sensors that we can put on the exterior of these robots in order to control them? We said, okay, let's do it. So uh, we built these capacitive sensors and we decided to test them out on a really simple system at first. So here you can see just a one degree of freedom arm that we call a grub. And we built a sensory sleeve for it. So here's just the grub with a sensor over it. Here you can see the white sensory sleeve, it's just a muslin fabric, and we've attached our sensors along the joints. We also have uh, markers for motion capture, and that's what we use as ground truth. And we also have an IMU, um, since that's a more standard way of, of tracking motion in these types of robots. Um, so we tracked both the position of the end effector and the joint angle. Um, that's because these things are decoupled in soft systems often. So in a more rigid system, if you know the joint angle, you know where your end effector is, typically. Um, in a soft system, that's not always the case. So the way that we actually tested these, you can see in one of these figures um, a bar sticking out at the end of the arm. We actually loaded up weights on that when we were testing it. So we would have the arm fully extended and then just load up tons and tons of weights at the end. And what we would often see is buckling at the joint um, because all of the materials were so compliant. So even if we meant to have just a zero joint angle, we would see some significant buckling um, and we called that an S-curve. And that would cause the end effector to be in a different position than we were actually telling it to be in based on what the joint angle was. So we tracked these two things separately and found that we were able to track them really well, um, just as well as the IMU and also uh, verifying it with the motion capture. So the next step was to take this out to a more complex system. So the next thing we did was build sensory sleeves for a, a three-fingered gripper. So this, again, was built by Other Lab. Um, the gripper is able to, you see it grasping lots and lots of objects. Um, but one of the really great things about this gripper uh, is that it's actually built to be a pack and deploy gripper. So it can deflate, take up very, very little room during transport, and then inflate in order to manipulate objects at its target location. So what we did is built Oops, I'm sorry. Ah, go back. There we go. We built uh, three sensory sleeves to go over each of the fingers of this gripper. Um, so you can see one long strain sensor along the length of the entire sleeve, and that would go over the joint. Uh, and then pressure sensors at the fingertips and midline, midway through the, sense, or through the finger in order to track actual gripping of objects. So here you can see the gripper actually performing a grasping motion. It's grasping this water bottle. Um, we're able to track the arm angle and the grip force using the sensor on the outside of the fingers and the two pressure sensors located at the fingertip and midway. Um, and here we're actually showing this pack and deploy sequence. So this, the uh, so gripper is completely packed down with the sleeves and the sensors on it. It's able to inflate up, which it will do in just a moment. Um, and then start performing, we're able to collect data on it as soon as it's inflated. So you can see at the beginning of the process that we're getting nonsensical data. Um, this is while it's, it's packed down and this is how we know that it's packed down because the data doesn't make any sense. And then as soon as it's sufficiently inflated, we can, we can start collecting state information. And then finally, we use this to do some basic closed loop control. 
So this was using a very simple controller, a PID controller, um, nothing super innovative going on on the control side, um, but using just our state feedback from the conductive composite capacitive sensors, um, we were able to track a set point pretty well. You can definitely see some offset from the set point. The blue represents the set point that we were trying to create. These are just open and closed motions, um, very simple over here. And then here, taking a little bit more steps as we're opening and closing. Um, and we are able to track those uh, basic motions fairly well. Obviously, there's room for improvement, but we were really excited by this result. So moving forward, we said, OK, our sensors are pretty good. We're able to track system state fairly well from the surface. So maybe we're ready to now put these sensors into our robotic skin concept and build out some robots. And so that is what I'm going to talk about next, looking at both actuation layers and sensory layers together to create full robotic skins. So our initial robotic skin prototypes have been using a variety of different sensors and actuators. Um, here you can see some prototypes made from shape memory alloy uh, actuators and the conductive composite sensors that are printed directly into a fabric. Um, and over here you can see a different type of layout uh, using McKibben, just pneumatic McKibben actuators, um, and also the, the capacitive sensors, again, um, all fabricated within the same robotic skin. So our concept was to wrap these skins around different objects in order to roboticize those objects. Um, obviously, the layout of the actuators makes a big difference in what we can actually wrap them around. So in the case of our parallel actuators, we can only accommodate single curvature bodies, like tubes of foam. Um, and in the case of our actuators laid out in triangulation, we're able to accommodate compound curvature bodies, and we sought to do that around objects such as tensegrity structures in order to make passive tensegrity structures into active robots. And finally, just to close the loop on the control discussion, pun intended, uh, we created a couple of different skins using shape memory alloy actuators and the pneumatic actuators and tested both for control with our sensors that I previously discussed, the connective composite capacitive sensors. Um, so here we have the shape memory alloy uh, skin with the parallel actuators just making this, this tube of foam bend, and we just looked at workspace of a tube of foam, um, and we were able to get really nice closed loop control in both cases. So that tells us that our sensors work across different technology platforms, so we can use them with different types of actuators, different types of substrates on different objects. So one of the first things that we wanted to do was show, so show this idea of transferability. So if we create a skin and we wrap it around something, we want to be able to take it off and put it around something else in order to get different types of functions. So we created three robotic skins, and we placed them around a long tube of foam to create a continuum manipulator or a continuum arm, a three-segment continuum arm. And then we took those exact three skins and took them off that manipulator or off the tube of foam and then showed different forms of locomotion. So I do have a video of this, which will hopefully turn that down. This is in real time, and we had a lot of fun making it. shows you the basic idea of transferability. So the skins were on similar objects. They were always on tubes of foam or either bodiless. So if we go back to the previous slide, um, we wrapped around a tube of foam and used kind of a crawling locomotion. So it had weighted end caps that would just thrust forward and then pull the whole body forward. Uh, we had an inchworm locomotion. And then this was a bodiless inchworm. So it was using just the robotic skin by itself, not actually attached to a deformable body in order to generate that locomotion. But showing both manipulation and uh, or continuum capabilities and locomotion capabilities uh, within the same hardware, just reconfigured on different objects. So let's skip that. OK, so a couple of other demos. Uh, we decided to roboticize a plush toy. So this is a stuffed animal horse. Um, let me make sure that this is off. So we took four robotic skins and just wrapped them around the legs of the horse, and then we're able to get uh, pretty lifelike-looking motions, I think. Um, and 
Yeah, we've had a lot of fun showing this demo to people who visit the lab. Um, we actually have a variety of different stuffed animals in the lab that we allow people to choose, and then we just take the robotic skins and quickly place them along the limbs and roboticize that to quickly demonstrate the idea that we can turn a just an animate stuffed object into a robot very, very quickly. Um, another demo that we created is actually showing continuum manipulation, so extending from the continuum robot arm and actually adding a gripper. So here you can see the three robotic skins wrapped around the tube, tube to create the three-segment continuum arm. Uh, and then we have a gripper created from two flat plates with a robotic skin between them that just pulls the plates together. Uh, in a second configuration, we have a passive finger and an active finger that grabs an object and places it in a desired location. We created a demo of the inchworm locomotion robot using uh, a light sensor. So this robot is, uh, is told to travel towards the light. So we create, or we put this flashlight in front of it and move it around in order to control where the robot is going. Um, and this actually shows how it can do pretty, pretty close turns in just a second. You'll see it doing a nice S turn. And then uh, finally, or not finally, second to last, um, we took the triangular robotic skins and put them around the six bar tensegrity structure. So some of you might have seen a structure that looks like this, um, tensegrity, six bar tensegrity ball. Um, this is actually a really common children's toy as well. Uh, and we took our robotic skins and placed them over the surface of this. So the six bar structure creates these nice triangular uh, placement uh, things that we can put the robotic skins on very nicely so they don't have to accommodate too much curvature. So it was a pretty simple demo for us to come up with. And here you can see the robotic skins actually locomoting this ball. So this is uh, a passive tensegrity structure being roboticized entirely from the surface, so using just membrane actuation along the surface. Then we took those exact same triangular robotic skins and we placed them on a shirt in order to create a wearable demo. So this is my postdoc, Joran. Um, he is exhibiting poor posture, um, which causes the, uh, we, we have these back sensors um, along the center of the spine uh, set to a threshold so that whenever he crosses that threshold when he's slouching, it uh, forces the robotic skins to start to pulse, to communicate with him that he should straighten up his posture. Um, so here you can see the raw data. The center line here is the threshold. So you can see whenever he is slouching, um, that that's when the robotic skins start pulsing to communicate with him and he straightens back up. You can see that in the data. So hopefully I have convinced you that we've created a platform technology, um, although maybe clunky in implementation, demonstrating this idea that we can create robotic skins that can be uh, put on certain objects, then taken off and put on other objects in order to create a more flexible design approach to soft robots that we can create different robots with different types of motions and different, um, different tasks that perform different tasks by just reconfiguring hardware on the surface of inert bodies. Um, so where are we going from here? We have a couple of forward directions that we're taking this in. All of our examples so far have shown robotic skins on inert deformable bodies, but we're also thinking about how robotic skins could be active molders of moldable bodies, so things like clay. If we take robotic skins, we wrap them around clay, can we cause active morphing? Um, and we have some preliminary work showing this. So here is a robotic skin that's been wrapped around a ball of clay, model magic, uh, and we can show forward rolling of the ball. Uh, and then we have it just compressed down, use all of its actuators uh, to radially compress the ball into a long cylinder. And then we have that cylinder showing inchworm locomotion. So uh, a simple demonstration of using robotic skins to actively change the morphology of the body that they're wrapped around. And then we also figured if we're going to be putting clay in these, uh, why not have the robot actually eat its own body? So uh, we came up with this idea of having the robotic skins just being placed on a granular matter or clay-like matter and being able to scoop its own body into itself and then utilize that body to perform different tasks. So we also have some preliminary work showing this. We were able to create robotic skins um, that when put on a surface are, are able to use some kind of representative motions to push uh, material into itself. So here, this is coffee, so it's, uh, it's not nearly as, um, as heavy and viscous as clay, um, but we were able to show it pushing the, the coffee into itself and creating its own body, and then manually shutting it, we were able to get some locomotion out of the system. 
Um, and then finally, I don't normally talk about uh, our origami work because it's a pretty small part of the lab, but I know that there are some people here very interested in origami, so I wanted to show you a little bit of work that we're doing on this. Um, this is very, very recent. Uh, it's another paper that's under review, so unpublished work. Um, but we created a heater silicone, so it's the same type of material or, that we use for the sensors, so the conductive composite that we use for sensing in our capacitive sensors. Um, instead of modifying it or specializing it for sensing, um, we modified it to, uh, to be a great heater. So here, this is the silicone heater, and we have liquid metal channels um, that allow us to get nice dual heating between desired locations. Um, and we can attach that to a thermally sensitive body in order to soften it on demand and create joints on demand out of an otherwise homogeneous body. So here our inert body is a PLA. Uh, it's just standard PLA that you would 3D print and you can see this sheet has been 3D printed. Um, I'll start playing this video. But by attaching it to this thermally responsive sheet, we can heat it and get different motions like stretching and compressing folding, obviously, and twisting, um, so kind of branching a little bit off of the origami framework. Um, but one thing that we did was created this addressable heater using the liquid metal electrodes in the heater silicone in order to target where we wanted the heat to be and make these artificial hinges, and then we were able to create uh, a paper airplane or PLA airplane um, using this approach. So with that, I want to thank the people who actually do the work, my current group and past group members, and also funding sources. Um, the work that you saw today was primarily supported by NASA under the ECF, um, and all of the liquid metal printing stuff was under NSF Career. Um, and the people probably most uh, affiliated with the work, Dr. Joran Booth is my postdoc working on robotic skins, um, and Shang Liang Zi Lu uh, is working on the liquid metal particle work. So thank you for your attention. So you showed this amazing video of this octopus. So the actuation of the octopus goes, how much of it is kind of a, a contraction of the surface versus some sort of bulk property inside the octopus in terms of pressure? I haven't studied the octopus as well as many other researchers, so I want to be a little bit tentative about how I answer this, but my understanding is that um, the muscles in the octopus are incredibly complex. So they have muscles that are both along the length of their tentacles and radial. Um, so I think that trying to mimic the exact placement of actuators would be really difficult because there would just be such a density of actuators. Um, but like Chichilia Lachi, for example, it has done really nice work showing basic layout of actuators that turns out to be really similar. It produces very, very similar movements to a real octopus. Um, so I think that there maybe are simpler solutions that can get close. Uh, another thing that I've definitely seen from Tertullio's work is that a lot of the octopus motion is passive. So they'll show that just by controlling the shoulder joint, if you can call it a shoulder joint, where the tentacles attach to the body, um, that a lot of the other motions are just very, very passive by just controlling this one area. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so I'm just wondering kind of actuation from the skin, right, that you're proposing versus right. kind of saying, well, you're going to combine it with something that's actually built into the bulk of the Sure. So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are no biological systems that I am aware of with completely skin-based actuation. Um, so this definitely cannot be called biomimetic um, as an idea or a concept. Um, that said, I, I think that it makes it a more flexible way of being able to introduce, if we can say, okay, all the actuation is on the surface, we're just going to take it off of this and put it onto that. Um, that's kind of the cleanest way that I can see to make inanimate passive bodies into active bodies very quickly. Um, but it certainly wouldn't optimize any one of those bodies. So none of our robots that we're going to create using this approach are going to be as great as something purpose-built for that purpose, right? Um, so if we make a locomotion robot, it's not going to be as good as something that's built just to be a locomotion robot. But we have the advantage of flexibility, being able to take off the hardware and put it on something else. So in places where you might have limited access to, or you know, let's say this is a NASA-funded project, so we often put it within the context of NASA missions. If we want to send things out to an unknown environment, uh, volume and weight are very costly in order to send up into space. We want to send up as little as possible. 
Um, so that's where a lot of this idea of being able to eat your own body comes from. We can send very, very little material out to an extraterrestrial environment, have the robot just deploy itself down, create its own body, and then be able to take itself and wrap itself around different things in order to perform different tasks, maybe not as efficiently as a robot built for that task, but having to transport very little to get there.